If there's one thing I hope I've convinced you with this series of lectures, it's that art is good for thinking. Art can be beautiful, interesting to look at, one of life's simple pleasures, but I think above all it allows us to think more deeply about so many different things. We've thought about art itself, and how it allows us to think through and about history. We've thought about art's relation to everyday life, to political power, to religion, to colonialism, and to activist resistance. We've analyzed how art informs the human body, the natural world, and technology. In each case, the objects we looked at allowed us to think more deeply about all these important themes. You'll likely also have noticed that art history entered into dialogue with so many other disciplines. We worked with philosophy, anthropology, archaeology, material culture, theology, the history of medicine, environmental studies, animal studies, music, post-colonial and decolonial studies, and so much else. You may not have realized how many different disciplines have informed these lectures, since I didn't always name them, but they did, and we learned more about them as we went along. It's fitting, then, that our last lecture is dedicated to art and thinking, even though really this has been a constant theme running throughout all these lectures. In this last session, though, we're going to focus on art objects that seem to have to do with thinking itself. Each work, from the oldest some 17,000 years ago, to the most recent made just a few decades ago, will say something about thinking, how we think, and what thinking itself might be. It should be said at the beginning, though, that thinking, consciousness, and the brain are still somewhat mysterious, even to neuroscientists. The mind is also much debated in philosophy, and so I want to begin with a little mind puzzle. Can thinking think itself? In other words, can we fully understand our minds by only using our minds? Or does this amount to a circular operation, one doomed to failure, since the mind can never stand outside itself to become an object for itself, to understand, take apart, and fully know? There's a further serious complication here, because we're coming to find that our minds are never simply the result of our brains, as if our brain is simply a central computing system in our skulls. No, our minds are conditioned by the rest of our body, especially our gut microbiome, which has a direct link to the brain along the axis of our spine, and the outside world, especially the environmental conditions we find ourselves living in. So this all complicates things even more in a fascinating way. I certainly won't solve these thorny problems here, but I do want to suggest that art might help. For what is art if not an externalization of the mind? And that being said, and that being the case, can't we begin to understand our minds and the ways we think by studying art objects that themselves are the result of human thought? Anyways, this is what we're after in this session, and we'll begin with a relatively recent work. Sometime during the 1960s, artists in the U.S. began considering art to be an idea. This meant that whatever idea they had for an artwork didn't even have to have a material component. Nothing had to be made. Instead, the art could exist as a concept. This was called conceptual art. One of the key conceptual artists of this period was Joseph Kosuth, and this is one of his key works, One and Three Chairs from 1965. It's very simple in execution, but very complex in theory. As you can see, Kosuth exhibits a physical folding chair made of wood in the gallery. On the wall to the left, he includes a photographic reproduction of the chair. On the wall to the right, he includes an enlarged photographic reproduction of the dictionary entry for quote-unquote chair. So he's giving us three different chairs, a real one, a photographic one, and a linguistic one. But wait, aren't these all real? The photograph exists just as much as the wood, as do the words in the dictionary that have been blown up. So where is the real chair? Not in the sense of existing materially, but in the sense of the idea of a chair. What is chairness? We might go back to the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who thought that our ideas and conce concepts exist in a different realm, what he called the realm of the forms, which is the only place where pure and, purfe pure and perfect ideas exist. When these ideas are put into practice, like when someone makes a chair out of wood, the resulting chair is only a pale imitation of the pure idea of chair. It's only an imperfect copy. Maybe this is what Kosuth meant when he titled his work One and Three Chairs. All three chairs reflect or represent the single idea of chair, but they aren't in and of themselves the concept of chair, only instances of it. But then where is this idea of chair? Is it only in our heads? If an alien came down and saw this work, would its extraterrestrial brain, 
if it had a brain, or eyes for that matter, would this alien understand the concept of chair through these three chairs? Or maybe we should think more anthropologically. Maybe the concept of chair evolved in proportion to the ways in which we use our bodies. The idea of chairness developed over time as things in the world we sit on. This would mean that the first chair was likely a log or a rock, or something like that. Whatever the case might be, Kosu's work, work is fascinating to ponder. It's an artwork that begs to be thought. What I find way more fascinating than the concept of chairness is the concept of the human. This too has developed and changed across different cultures and times. The idea of being human is a historical thing, and it wasn't always here. Our conception of what it means to be human is informed by so many different things that are relatively recent in the history of our species. The idea of individuality, the lessons we gain from biology and our understanding of evolution, the legal notion of human rights, which only came to pass beginning in the 18th century, the development of language, especially in its written form, and so much else. So before all these developments, what did our human ancestors think of themselves before the concept of being human was fully formed as it is today? Well, maybe we should go back to prehistoric times and try to think these thoughts, um, which actually may be quite unthinkable. In 1940, <clears throat> four teenagers accidentally discovered an important prehistoric cave in southwestern France. These are the Lascaux Caves. The image found inside fascinated the French philosopher Georges Bataille, who thought they represented the cradle of Homo sapiens. He argued that they bear witness to the first moment when humans took a critical distance on their lives and surroundings, becoming self-conscious and able to question things more deeply. For Bataille, art, art making was key for this, because it allowed early humans to play and enter into fictional spaces. It allowed them to develop symbolism right there on the walls. One of the images he focuses, focuses on is this one, a relatively rare instance of prehistoric painting that depicts a human. Overwhelmingly, in Lascaux and many of the other caves, caves that have been discovered, non-human animals are the predominant figures. This, then, is a unique opportunity to see how early humans stood outside of themselves and represented themselves to themselves. And this is where things become really interesting. For instance, why is the figure so much less defi defined than the bison and all the other animals that we see in these caves, which are painted in far more dynamic and realistic ways? This human, by contrast, is just a stick figure. He seems to be so much less powerful than the horned bison that plows over him. Is this, image, is this image a recognition of being weaker? Is it paying homage to the bison? His head also seems to be more bird-like than human. Why is that? Did this person identify with the flying creatures around him? Did he consider himself to be like them in some ways? I mean, remember, the divide between human and animal didn't exist yet, and actually neither did the concept of human or the concept of animal. Another fascinating question. If this is a moment of death, He's being plowed over by, by the bison. Uh, what did death mean for these early humans? How did they first become aware of their own mortality? Was it through their interaction with non-human animals like this bison? And did they have a concept of the afterlife? These are only a fraction of the fascinating and probably unanswerable questions we could come up with about this prehistoric image. Like Kosu's much more recent artwork, it's a moment for thinking not only for the humans who painted them, th these images centuries ago, but for us today. The Renaissance was a time of rekindling interest in all things ancient Greece, so it's no surprise that we find artists depicting the key thinkers from those many centuries ago. In Rome, Pope Julius II commissioned Raphael, who along with Leonardo and Michelangelo comprised the big three of the High Renaissance, to paint frescoes in one of the more important rooms of the Vatican, one of these frescoes is called the School of Athens, or simply Philosophy, and is a visual catalog of some of the key thinkers from Western antiquity. The word philosophy comes from the Greek words philia, which means love, and sophia, which means wisdom. So philosophers are lovers of knowledge. And when it comes to ancient Athens, the two most important philosophers were Plato and Aristotle. In fact, these are probably the two most important thinkers of the Western tradition. It's no surprise, then, that Raphael places them in the dead center of the composition. And notice how the vanishing point of his expertly used linear perspective in this painting is right between their heads. 
And you can always tell the difference as to, as to who is who by their age, their hand gestures, and their clothing. Plato was older. Aristotle was younger and once his student. Plato points upwards, which has to do with his philosophy of truth. Remember, he thought that truth was a concept that lived in another realm above and beyond the material world, what he called the realm of forms. Aristotle, on the other hand, is gesturing downwards, as if, as if to respond, no, truth is what we see and observe in the material world around us. Generally speaking, Plato and Aristotle kicked off the two competing schools that will run throughout Western philosophy, idealism and empiricism. Finally, the clothing that Raphael has given these two thinkers corresponds to the four elements. Plato wears purple and red, which signify the elements that rise, ether and fire, while Aristotle wears blue and brown, which signifies the weighty elements, water and earth. This too emphasizes the differences between idealism, which finds truth in a metaphysical world, and empiricism, which finds, which, which finds truth in a purely physical world. Another giveaway? Well, they're each holding one of their most important works. Plato, his dialogue, the Timaeus, and Aristotle, his, Nico, his Nicomachean ethics. If we, if we move to the left on Plato's side, we find what's likely the figure of Socrates. As usual, he's talking people's ears off, asking endless questions, and ending up showing how their beliefs don't really hold much water. Ultimately, he was killed for his critical truth-telling skills. Read Plato's dialogue called The Apology for an amazing account of Socrates' trial in Athens. Below this scene of Socrates is the philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. He's holding one of his books and is probably giving a lesson on musical ratios and number. Pythagoras thought that music and harmony could unlock the order of the cosmos. In front of him is the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, who taught that existence is a continuous flux and in a state of constant change. On the other side of the painting we find Euclid. He's giving students a geometry lesson on a chalkboard using a compass. Behind him is the Persian ethical philosopher Zoroaster and the, and, uh, the astronomist Ptolemy who holds a round globe. Already the ancient Greeks understood that our earth is round. Then the figure that seems to be looking right, right, up, right at you in the black cap and that's Raphael himself, the painter. Finally, we have Diogenes, sprawled out on the steps, almost half naked. He was the great instigator of ancient Athens. Almost like a performance artist, he would do things that show how his fellow humans lived, lived inauthentically or in denial about certain truths. Preferring the company of dogs to humans, he lived on the outskirts of town with little to no possessions to tie him down. In all, Raphael's fresco shows how important philosophy is and was to the Renaissance. By this point in the early 16th century, even the very center of the Catholic Church in the Vatican paid homage to the history of Western human thought, which is really telling. Divine knowledge and human knowledge coexisted, at least for now. We should also emphasize that without the influence of non-Western philosophies and belief systems, the Western tradition would not have developed in the way it did. For example, we can find the influence of Buddhism on ancient Greek philosophers, these very philosophers here. The Persian philosopher Zoroaster, who is depicted in Raphael's mural, also had an influence on Greek philosophy. And perhaps one of the most important influences were the Arabic philosophers. Not only did Arabic translators preserve the major texts of Greek, uh, of Greek philosophy during the Middle Ages, but they also altered Western thought, allowing it to be reintegrated into Western knowledge by this time of Raphael and the Renaissance. So, for example, the 12th century Islamic philosopher Averroes almost single-handedly shaped the way Aristotle was understood in subsequent Western history. It's fitting then that we take a look at an Islamic work in this session on thinking. This is the Hall of the Two Sisters in the Palace of the Lions at Alhambra from the 14th century, and part of an incredible series of structures that uses complex geometrical, geometrical patterns. The history of mathematics is indelibly informed by Arab Arabic philosophers of the Middle Ages. And you'll remember our last session on technology when we, met, when we mentioned Al-Hazm and his contributions to the study of optics and perspective. It's no coincidence that the word algebra comes from Arabic. Islamic mathematicians made great breakthroughs during this period, picking up on where ancient Greek and Indian mathematicians 
left off. We often see geometrical complexity in Islamic architecture, and this dome is an amazing case in point. It's made of thousands of mukhanas, small carvings that create a honeycomb-like effect. These are radiantly, radiantly exposed by 16 windows that make the design of the dome seem as if it's floating in the air, in light. More than simply beautiful, though, this dome and hall was also built with acoustics in mind, and it's thought that it was used as a music chamber. This is only a brief stopping point on the history we're tracing in this session on art and thinking, and one of many non-Western examples we could discuss if we had more time. In 1533, Han Holbein the Younger was court painter to Henry VIII, the English king who would prompt a split from the Roman Catholic Church that led to the Anglican Church. In an, in an attempt to head off this split, two French ambassadors were sent to England to try and convince Henry VIII to keep England Catholic. These diplomats were Jean de Danteville and the Bishop Georges de Sèvres. Holbein was commissioned to memorialize this event by painting their full-length double portrait and the resulting painting you're seeing here, the French ambassadors. The political ambassador is on the left in seriously lavish garb. The bishop is on the right, somewhat more modestly dressed, keeping his coat closed with his left hand. Between them are two shelves of various books, instruments, and tools. These are meant to show that they are learned men, everything from musical composition, to science, to mathematics, to theology, to geography, to really all branches of human knowledge. And there is a term for this, humanism. Humanism is more or less synonymous with the Renaissance. To be a humanist is to be well-rounded when it comes to knowledge, culture, and education. To be a humanist is also to recognize the intellectual achievements of past humans, especially the ancient Greeks and Romans. Today we live in a by and, by and large secular world where politics, science, and much of human knowledge is kept separate from religion. Historically, this is a relatively new development. For much of Western history, and non-Western history, religion and spiritual traditions were ultimately tied to politics and knowledge. Worldviews were divinely centered and ordained. This was still the case in Holbein's time. However, cracks and separations are beginning to appear between religious and non-religious knowledge. In fact, this seems to be one of this painting's themes. And there are at least two ways Holbein is reminding these two humanist diplomats, not to get too wrapped up in their enjoyment of human knowledge and their fancy objects. Although the diplomats themselves don't seem to notice it, I'm sure you probably noticed that weird blob on the floor in the front. This is an anamorphic image that Holbein included, which is an image that you can only see from a specific angle, made with a special, special perspective. When you see this painting in real life at the National Gallery in London, you have to stand to the right of the painting and kneel a little bit to see it properly. Here's what happens when you do that. A bony human skull appears. This is a traditional mento mori, or reminder of death. It's often been used to remind the viewer to remain pious and faithful, to not get too caught up in material existence, which distracts from religious calling. So in the context of this double portrait, it's a skull that seems to emanate from another realm, literally from another perspective, which puts into perspective the desire for humanist knowledge that these French ambassadors seem to embody. Then there's that little detail Holbein included at the top left corner of the painting. Behind the green curtain that's been parted just a hair, we notice, this, we notice a silver crucifix. It's really hard to make out, and that's the point. Holbein seems to be saying something about religion here. Maybe that it's in the process of being relegated to the background in favor of humanist knowledge. So this painting has everything to do with the role of human reason and thinking in the world that back then was still ordered by religious truths. It's the beginning of the tug of war between human knowledge and divine knowledge. By the time we get to the 18th century, the Enlightenment is in full swing. At this point, religious and divine truths began to be challenged by human thinking, reason, reasoning, and questioning. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant put it best. He said that the Enlightenment is the use of reason alone to find things out about the world, rather than relying on a higher authority, like divine scripture. Instead of blindly believing what you've been told, Kant says, dare to know through your own thinking. 
Moreover, the development of the modern scientific method of observation and experimentation was very important for the Enlightenment, something we can see in this painting by Joseph Wright, an, an experiment on a bird in the air pump from 1768. This shows a philosopher. Back then, a philosopher was someone who knew about a lot of things, even scientific things, and not just philosophy in the restricted sense we use this word today. The philosopher is performing a scientific experiment. He's doing so not in a laboratory, but in someone's home. At this time, this type of experiment was, experiment was used to show burgeoning scientific knowledge, but it was also used to entertain people, almost like a party trick. Philosophers like this one would go from town to town, setting up experiments in wealthy people's homes. So, what is this experiment all about? It was first constructed a century before by the philosopher Robert Boyle in a landmark for the history of Western science. There were debates about air and vacuums, namely whether or not a vacuum in space can exist. Rather, th rather than looking for an answer in the Bible, Boyle decided to set up an experiment so to settle the dispute. He made a pump that could suck out the air of a glass container. In order to see whether or not a vacuum was created by this pump, an animal was placed inside, canary in the coal mine style. Seeing that the animals would get asphyxiated, Boyle confirmed that indeed vacuums can exist in space. And this was a powerful moment because it showed that truth about the world could be gained through human reasoning and science rather than divine revelation. And most importantly, the results of the experiment were objective. It was nature that relieved itself through the, the experiment without the interference of human prejudices or presumptions. In Wright's painting, there are various reactions to this groundbreaking experiment. The little girls, who are dramatically lit by a single candle that sits behind a mysterious glass jar, are horrified by it. The white cockatoo in the air pump is probably their beloved pet, and they can't bear to see the bird suffer or die. The man who seems to be persuading them to look at the experiment might be their father. He doesn't seem to be affected by the bird in the pump. Instead, he seems to be saying that scientific knowledge is worth the sacrifice. Though I should say, usually at the last moment, in these experiments, the bird would be released from the pump before suffocating completely. The boy and the older men at the table seem to be fascinated by this scientific experiment, in contrast to the horrified girls. And this is probably a gender dynamic that still seems to play out today when it comes to empathizing for animal suffering. Then there's the young couple at the left who are looking at each other. Maybe they're in love and they don't seem to care about what's happening in front of them at all. They just have to be there. Through all these different figures and reactions, Wright seems to be giving us, in a nutshell, the possible relationships to enlightenment and science. Cold calculating reason that forges ahead for knowledge. Emotional responses that worry about the human and non-human costs of science and pure reasoning. And those that simply aren't paying attention. Another key aspect of the enlightenment is the development of ethics and moral philosophy. For a long time, morality was conditioned by religious and scriptural laws. Thou shall not kill, for example. In other words, what it meant to live an ethical life was conditioned by all sorts of beliefs and traditions, some of which maybe today we would deem to be unethical. Kant plays an important role here as well. He developed a philosophy of morality that relied on human reasoning alone, one that would not be prejudiced by custom and tradition. It's a complex moral theory, but it can be boiled down in the following way. Kant said, we should never treat a human being as a means to an end. Human beings have to be understood as ends in themselves. And incidentally, some philosophers today are applying this to non-human animals as well, that they too shouldn't be treated simply as means to an end. In other words, a living human being should not be used as a mere instrument or tool. This holds a number of ramifications above all for the practice of human slavery. Because what is a slave if not someone who's been reduced to an impersonal instrument, to pick cotton or tend sugarcane, for example? Even if not everyone lived up to it, the Enlightenment was the moment when the idea of human rights began to be articulated, most famously during the Re French Revolution and the writing of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which had a major influence on the development of democracy in the US and Europe. 
Unfortunately, when Haiti revolted as one of France's slave colonies in, in 1791, just after the French Revolution that inspired the Haitians, they were violently put down, as if the rights of man did not apply to them. It's therefore not surprising that the abolitionist movement came into being during this time in the 18th century, in Britain and elsewhere, arguing ethically against slavery by deeming it to be immoral. We see this in this medallion that was designed by William Hackwood. He made it for the early industrialist Josiah Wedgwood, who was the first to use the steam engine on his production line. So along with the Enlightenment, uh, this period sees the beginning of the Industrial Revolution as well. There's a lot going on. Wedgwood was an ardent abolitionist, and he commissioned this design for the anti-slavery campaign in England. This image was mass-produced, and it made its way not only onto medallions like this one that could be worn, like political buttons today, or slogans, but also belt buckles, bracelets, necklaces, and other, and other things. And it's, it's ethical, it is ethical thinking in practice. An Afro-descendant man is shackled to chains at his wrists and arms, kneeling in profile as if praying or pleading. Above him are the words written, Am I not a man and a brother? This question seems to be coming from the slave's position and rhetorically asks for recognition of his humanity. Although this medallion became a key symbol of the abolitionist movement, Britain would ultimately make human slavery illegal in 1833, though tellingly they made an exception for their colony in India, there is a way in which it reproduces certain racial stereotypes. Above all, it makes it seem as if this person is in need of a savior and cannot represent himself. Two features of this work that may very well be problematic. Although the Enlightenment brought us many great things, not least of which Western science and the moral concept of human rights and dignity, there are some philosophers and thinkers who have argued that the Enlightenment, even with all its benefits for humankind, has a dark side. For example, the scientific unlocking of the atom opened the way for the incredible destruction at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And more generally, advances in technology and science are not always used ethically or with an eye towards human well-being and emancipation. Sometimes it's just used for profit. There's also the fact that it every, if everything can be explained through cold and calculating reason, then the world becomes a less enchanting place, maybe one that's purely mechanistic and indif indifferent to our needs for greater meaning, if we have needs for greater meaning. To be told that the love you feel for your family or a significant other is just a chemical reaction in your brain and nothing more somehow doesn't seem all that satisfying. In other words, the world can become a cold and deterministic place. The Norwegian artist Edvard Munch may have felt the world to be such a cold and hostile place, especially the modern cities he found himself in, like Paris and Berlin. He had a difficult life. When he was young, he lost his mother and one of his sisters to tuberculosis. His, work, his early work is likely impacted by these sad events in his life. Munch was also a writer, and we have some lit literary fragments of his, some of which may relate to his most famous work that you're seeing here, The Scream. In one of these stories, he writes in the first person as walking on a bridge with his friends. His friends then leave him alone to lean over the railing of the bridge. Suddenly, he's paralyzed and feels the scream of nature coursing through his body. Was this the onset of a depressive episode? Was it a panic attack? Truth is, we're not sure. These literary fragments may or may not be autobiographical, which means that the scream may or may not be a self-portrait. Whatever the case may be, this painting does seem to be a raw depiction of anxiety and anguish. It's as if his mental condition is influencing the elements around him, or vice versa. The blood-red orange sky hovers over the figure like waves, while the landscape and body of water to the right of the bridge swirls upward as if gravity has been reversed. There are two anonymous figures in the back, maybe those two friends from the story, which lend a further feeling of disconnect and isolation. Then, of course, there's the central figure, who, through utter simplicity, evokes straight-up horror and despair. It's a really famous picture, but actually not an easy one to look at. 
Munch read wild, widely, including the Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky. In Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky's great book, The Brothers Karamazov, one of his central characters in that book says at one point, without God, everything is possible. Maybe Munch read this line and was influenced by it. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche had also just said that God is dead at the end of the 19th century. What both Dostoevsky and Nietzsche likely meant was that in the new modern world, one ruled by science and rationality, there was no place left for divine authority. The Enlightenment had succeeded in chasing away all the superstitious and unscientific claims of religion. Moreover, both Dostoevsky and Nietzsche were worried about this development in Western modernity because they wondered, without a divine authority, who now backs the laws and the moral codes that society needs to live by? How does one live ethically in a godless modern world? People like Dostoevsky and Nietzsche asked themselves. Maybe Munch's screamer on the bridge here had this sudden re re realization, which wouldn't really have been possible any other time in history. Namely, that there's no meaning, that, that we're completely alone in an indifferent universe with no divine being telling us how or even why to live. Decades later, existentialist philosophers will take up these questions and say that it's none other than ourselves who make meaning, that we and only we are responsible for who we are and what we are. So this kind of existentialist paralysis um, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, solitude we might actually already find in Munch's very famous scream from uh, the early 20th century. Okay, so we're now into the late and 19th, we're now into the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which was a time of incredible creativity and intellectual breakthroughs. So think of the invention of film, which was invented in 18, um, um, 1897 or Einstein's relativity theory, or the development of quantum mechanics, and so much else. These breakthroughs forced us to completely rethink what we thought reality was. So, as it turns out, space and time are not the same everywhere, or even constant. The only thing that's constant and absolute is the speed of light. Light, this, the, that, goes, that goes by the speed of light, comes in both wave and particle form. And images now can move and slow down, allowing us to see things with the human eye we'd never seen before. And this intellectual upheaval was no less in painting. Artists began to question the rules of painting that had been set since the Renaissance, especially linear perspective. And one of the first painters to do so was Paul Cézanne. It was once said that Cézanne's still lifes weren't still enough. And indeed, that's true. We do get a sense that some of the apples are about to roll off this uneven and distorted table. The painter thought there was something wrong with him, that he couldn't see properly. But it wasn't until much later in his life that he, came, he gained recognition for his paintings, and people started understanding what he was up to. Cézanne is the philosopher's painter. The French existentialist philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty loved his work and wrote about it extensively. Merleau-Ponty claimed that Cézanne was the first painter to introduce our bodies into the canvas and the way we actually see the world. Single-point perspective is decidedly not how we see the world. It's actually quite disembodied. You'll remember, linear perspective is an immovable point onto which our vision converges. It's an ideal perspective in an ideal space. Is that how we really see in our everyday lives? Well, no. We're bifocal creatures, seeing out of two eyes, not a single eye or perspective. On top of that, we're never still. When we look at the world, this table I'm writing on, for example, my head is constantly shifting, which means my point of focus, my perspective, is also constantly shifting, as is my peripheral vision, which creates all sorts of distortions in the way I perceive the world. We don't think about it, but there are all sorts of distortions and shifts in perspective when we uh, in the way we see and in the way our eyeballs and bodies inhabit the world. If you stop and pay close attention, you'll start to see where what you thought were straight lines actually start to bend, and the objects in your peripheral vision will morph and change, however subtly. Unlike any other painter before him, this is what Cézanne was trying to achieve in his paintings. Not an idealized single-point view of the world, 
but a real and embodied way of seeing the world. This explains the table in his still life with apples here, which seems to bend and distort as it goes under the white tablecloth. The bottle, too, seems to change perspectives from one side to the other. And maybe you can pick out other visual quirks in this painting that run counter to linear perspective and its idealized view of vision. Another key intellectual breakthrough during this time happened in linguistics. The Swiss thinker Ferdinand de Saussure developed one of the first modern theories of language in the early 20th century, which showed that the words we use are in some sense arbitrary. For example, the word for tree didn't come into being with those green leafy things we see outside our windows. No, we use the symbol, the sign tree, as a convention that developed over time. And this convention only works and has meaning as part of the over, overall structure of our language system. How so? Well, this is a tricky idea, but basically it goes like this. Tree, the word tree means tree only because every other word in the English language does not mean tree. It works in a process of elimination. Meaning is predicated on this differential with all the other symbols and signs in the system. It might sound crazy, but this means that if one day we decided that the symbol dog no longer pointed to our furry companions, but pointed instead to those green leafy things outside our windows, what we formerly called trees, it would work. We would understand each other. This is what Saussure meant by arbitrary. He liked to give an example to make this difficult idea a little bit clearer. Imagine you're with a friend and you want to play chess, but your chess set is missing the kings. Well, as long as you and your partner agree on it, you can use any object you want to take the place of the missing kings, like two toy cars, for example, and it'll work. So Seal said the same about the signs we use when we use language. Some art historians have argued that Picasso's, one of the most important artists of the early, early, Western, um, early 20th century, demonstrates this theory of language that was being developed around the same time. Around 1911, he and George Black began using newspapers, colored paper, wallpaper, and other scraps that normally had not been thought of as art materials, like traditional painting or marble. This was the invent invention of collage which means gluing in French, as in gluing papers to the surface. This might not seem all that radical now, but in 1912 it was a huge breakthrough that opened new possibilities for what could be used in art making. This is Picasso's Bottle of Sous from that same year. It's made with newspaper, wallpaper, colored paper, and the label of a Sous bottle. Sous is a popular alcohol in France that's usually drunk before dinner as an apéritif. This work is part of Cubism, which Picasso and Braque developed together during these years. Cubism used simplified shapes, fragmented shapes, to show you a picture, an image, while also emphasizing the material aspects of this very picture or image. In other words, Cubism tried to show you depth, an image, and flatness, the surface of the, of the material, all at the same time, which if you think about it, is a really difficult proposition. So, in this example, you get the sense of a still life, a table at a bar with glass and bottle, but also a sense of the surface of the collage, especially through the flatness of the newspaper and the wallpaper. So the reason why some art historians argue that Picasso shows us how language works is a little like those chess pieces I mentioned earlier. Rather than using paint to represent the world, Picasso used different types of paper. He switched it out. Moreover, he shows us how the meaning of these pieces of paper only work within the overall system of the collage. So, if I'd only shown you this part, the top of the Sue's bottle, you wouldn't be able to decipher its meaning. Same goes for the side of the table. This just reads like a meaningless strip of blue paper. But, put them back in the context of the whole image, of the whole collage system, and they start to make sense again. They start to gain meaning by playing off the other elements in the system, just like the words we use in our sentences, according to Saussure's linguistics. The arbitrariness comes, comes in 
when we realized that Picasso could have used any type of paper or any section of the newspaper. And sometimes the same newspaper is used twice, but used for different perceptual meanings. This is painting no longer as representation, but painting as symbolic, painting that functions more like language. If the linguistic aspects of Picasso's work might feel dry and abstract, which I understand, surrealism is just the opposite. The surrealists were interested in Sigmund Freud's theory, messy theory, of the unconscious, which was a revolutionary theory about the human mind. For the first time, it was thought that parts of us are inaccess inaccessible to ourselves, that we're actually split in some ways. We have conscious thoughts, but underneath all these conscious thoughts are inaccessible unconscious desires. The Freud and the Surrealists did think, though, that we could get a glimpse of our unconscious mind in certain ways, above all through dreams. The Surrealists even hypnotized each other to try and gain access to their own unconscious material. And so, as you might imagine, this interest in dreams and the unconscious resulted in dreamlike images, as in this very famous painting by Salvador Dali. Freud thought that much of what's in our unconscious mind is actually too difficult and traumatic for us to admit to ourselves. He said, he said that these are our deepest and darkest desires and drives. And so our minds, our conscious minds, hide this from us, except, of course, when we're asleep and dreaming, when the unconscious starts to creep out and images start to surface through dreams. These dreams, though, these images are never direct representations. They're always metaphoric. They're always symbolic. And this is why dreams can be so strange uh, and not literal, according to Freud. Our dreams need to be interpreted in order to unlock their true meanings. They're never really what they are. There's always something underneath. And so these melting clocks, the ants that scurry out of the pocket watch on the bottom left of the painting, or that strange horse-like blobby figure in the center, or those broad vistas in the landscape that actually don't seem to make perceptual sense at all, these all stand in for something. They stand in from something else. They're symbolic and metaphoric of something in Dali's unconscious. And through his painting, we can get a, a recreation of his dreamscapes that probably troubled him quite a bit. Freud thought that the Surrealists were a bit crazy, that they had taken his theories to extreme or dangerous levels and used them for dangerous practices. But this is a key example of an art movement in the early 20th century being influenced by an important thinker. It's an example of art and thinking converging. Finally, we arrive at a more recent work by Cindy Sherman. Some of her earliest works are called the film stills, which is a large body of work comprising many different black and white photographs. What they all have in common is that they feature the artist taking her own picture. And sometimes in some of them, not this one, but you'll see the clicker she uses to take the photograph. So it's basically like an early type of selfie. In this one, untitled film still number 21 from 1978, she looks like a young professional, maybe a secretary, who's looking back at something or someone and rather ominously. The angle from below evokes a film noir aesthetic from the 1940s, so like a movie like Sunset Boulevard, which is a classic. In essence, she takes on a female role that you might find in the history of movies. We don't really get the full effect of this photographic series, though, by only looking at one of them. Instead, they're meant to be seen all together. The effect, then, is of a young woman who assumes many different roles and female stereotypes along many different genres, everything from advertising to film to TV to fashion magazines. When seen in totality like this, some interesting questions about identity come up. For one, where is the real person behind all these assumed identities? Or maybe there is no real person behind these identities. Maybe the ways in which we form our identities are actually rooted in the visual culture we've consumed in our lives, and that we're composites of what we've identified with. So what parts of our identity uh, are fixed and what parts are flexible? In other words, what parts of us are hard-coded and what parts of us are performed? This is the old nature-nurture question. These questions became very current in the 1970s and 1980s, and they continue to fascinate us today. 
It's central to the practice of media and cultural studies. There's also an interesting feminist critique in this series of photographs by Sherman. Simply put, they show, the female stereo they show that female stereotypes are assumed and, any and in many ways imposed from the outside rather than natural or essentially feminine. This realization can be emancipatory, especially the idea that women can perform as many roles in society as men can. We've come to the end of our sessions. I hope you enjoyed them and learned from them. I also hope you'll keep looking at art, that you'll keep thinking about history, and that you'll allow yourself to be changed by those experiences.